is telling us to do. Use our voices. Come on, let's just give him a good 30 seconds to a minute of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I told the 930 crowd this, and I'll tell you this, that I've waited all week to come to church and worship with my church family. So I don't want to take this for granted, and I don't want to take a day off. Amen. If you will, why don't you turn to someone, tell them that you love them. It's good to see them in the house of God worshiping with us. If you see a guest, tell them it's so good to see them today. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for joining us for our 11 o'clock service. We pray and hope that you're having a great day. Amen. You can have a seat. I'm going to go through a couple of announcements really quick. Ushers, if you would come join me at the front so I can get through this pretty quick so we can get back to our worship service. But just a reminder... Uh, we are still during the COVID season, if no one knew. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm sure we all know. But if, if you have been in close contact with a family member or anyone that you've been in close contact with, please go through the self-quarantine. Please don't show up to church the next day. Do us a favor because we're trying to make sure that everyone has a safe place to worship because the last thing we want to do is go back to online services only. I know... I know hearing from pastor that I, hopefully that won't ever happen, but let's just keep that in mind. UPCI General Conference is this week. It is starting September 22nd. That is Tuesday, and it is going to Friday. They will be live streaming the services on their website and their Facebook page. Today is the last day to give to She's for Christ. If you would like to give to that fund, please give today. This is the last day to give to that. And lastly, our student conference revive is coming up the first weekend in october that is october 2nd through the 4th and uh, that is going to be for current students only and their guests they can invite someone we're trying to do that to keep the crowd down but i think it's going to be life-changing for our students to hear a word from our youth president brother drew galloway he will be our guest speaker amen let's go pray over this offering and then let's get right back into the worship set father thank you so much for today god thank you so much for all your wonderful blessings that you have poured upon us god i pray for the remainder of this service that when we leave here today god we feel freedom and we feel deliverance god i pray for everyone that is giving today i pray that you bless them in a mighty way and everybody said in jesus name amen
surgery and I was still a little bit out of it, but those four women came in. I remember them praying for me and it was so powerful. I remember there's some things that I don't remember and there's some things that I do. I remember Ryan and Sherry coming on their way out of town and Ryan laying across me in the hospital bed praying for God to heal me. He believed for my healing when my faith was low. People in this church believed me, believed that God was going to heal me and did so much. I cannot thank this church enough. Brandon and Deanne Cox came over just to change the sheets on my bed. Do you know what that meant? I felt so much love from this church. My school, the teachers, they had prayer for me. And if you don't believe that God is still present in our school system, you are wrong. There are still people that believe in God that are still praying in our schools and leading and believing for healing. those four women coming in and praying for me vaguely later on that afternoon I had noticed a card that they had left on the table and I opened up the card and one of the women wrote this cancer is an imposter it does not belong in the body of a child of God that woman had no idea what was going on upstairs the day before if you don't believe God doesn't see you know your need. He knows everything. He knows it all. He sees you wherever you are. You cannot go too far from his grace and his mercy. You can't. I was, I did fine. I felt like I handled chemo like a champ. God showed me so much favor. And then I had to have the port put in my brain. And that fear came back. And I was like, oh God, I'm going to gonna make it. I was so afraid and God would send people like Jenny Weisinger, Wendy Covey, just I, if I start naming names, my brother who's watching in Cincinnati, he watched the morning service this morning and he texted me and he said, I still just cannot stop crying. Michael, pray with me church. Right now, in Jesus' name, I pray that the Holy Ghost lands wherever you are. And I pray that you speak in tongues and that it rolls out of you like waves of glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're watching online, I pray the same thing for you. Waves of glory. Anyway, that fear, man, it just kept coming back. And I was like, God, I'm just not going to make it this time. shirt came from. Hardest day of my life. I had given up. I was tired. I was in pain. The shirt showed up in my mailbox. If you don't believe that my God sees where you are, He knows your need. I stood up and lady opened up this shirt and I said, I don't know where it came from. There's no name. But I tell you one thing, faith rose up in me and I was determined Yes, we can see. 
salt of the earth. They don't come any better. I don't even want to say that C word. He's going to Dallas tomorrow to Baylor to see if I've accepted him in a clinical trial. He's probably watching right now. I want Wendy to go into that bridge, and when she does, we're going to pray for Floyd Odom in my life. We're going to pray that we pray for Wendy. Floyd's been battling this for how long? Three years? I don't know. We're fixing to believe God for it. Do you believe what she's saying? Do you believe it? When Jesus turned the water into wine, the Bible said, this is the beginning of heaven. That was the first of many in the book of Acts. When Luke opened up the book of Acts, he didn't say this is going to be the end of the miracles. He said this is the beginning of all that Jesus began to do in me. There is no the end at the book of Acts. There's no salutation ending saying, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. There's none of that. The book of Acts does not have an ending. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no amen. We're living in Acts 29 right now. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I'm the God that healeth me. So when you get ready to go back in that bridge, let's let Jesus have his way right now. Wendy, all your friends, your family. I saw your mother. Your Father, God bless you. Thank you for coming. Let's take Floyd to the throne in my right now. In the name of Jesus, sing it, Sister Wendy, sing it. Miracles happen. Go ahead and put those pictures back on the screen. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move.
somebody raise a hallelujah right now. Somebody raise a hallelujah. I've already preached it once, so they'll put it on the internet and you can watch it again. Just let me uh, let me introduce a thought to you. I just want to speak on this right quick. Behold, he cometh. Behold, he cometh. I draw my text from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Song of Solomon, Solomon is an allegory between the king and a little shepherd girl. You can be seated. It's an allegory between Solomon, who had all these wives, you know, concubines. Brother Ronnie Lacombe said, there are some things that he and God don't dis- dis- that he and God disagree on. And that was one of them. Solomon had 700 wives and 400 concubines, and God called him the wisest man. And he said, I didn't understand that. All you men said amen. You scared? Yeah, he shouted it real loud because his wife's not here. Sister Coker, if you're watching, that was your husband that shouted amen. But it's an allegory of a little country girl, a little nobody, and King Solomon was stewarding his vineyards and he saw her and fell in love with her. It's kind of like me and you, isn't it? We shouldn't be here. But the king saw us. I love that song when he was on the cross. I was on his mind. I don't even know how he found me where I lived, that little podunk town. But he did. But listen to what she said. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh sitting, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, and fair one, and come away. This is an allegory of the rapture of the church. Just as Anxious as we are for him to come. He's that anxious to come. You notice it said when he comes. She said when he came I saw him. He was leaping upon the mountains. He was skipping upon the hills. He stood behind the wall. He looked through the lattice. He's looking through the window. As anxious as I am for him to come. He's that anxious to come and get his bride and take us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 1 and 7 echoed these words and said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Something momentous happened this week. The leaders of four nations gathered in the White House and did something that the pundits said would never happen, but the Bible said would happen. Three Middle East nations, or two Middle East nations, and the president was there signing a peace agreement. The president said there are six or seven more nations who are in talks that are going to sign that. Now, what's interesting about that? 
is that in the Bible, there's going to be a man coming. I'm not saying Trump is the Antichrist. Please don't go out and say that. But there's a man coming who's going to work peace between Israel and the rest of the world. Now, if that would have happened when I was a teenager, ever everybody cold in the Lord would have got warmed up. Every prodigal would have been run into the church. Right? Anybody that felt like they weren't ready would have got ready quick. They'd have been beside their bed at night repenting of everything they've ever done, everything they didn't do. Just getting their heart right and getting cleaned up. That happened this week and there's so much turmoil in our country that we hardly paid attention. Kind of amazing. Friday was the beginning of what the Old Testament calls the Feast of Tabernacles. It is, in modern day terminology among the Jewish people, Rosh Hashanah. I may not say that right, but you can't say it right either. So we're all on the same page, all right? It was the end of harvest feast that God commanded Israel to come to every year. Come to this last feast every year. And it was the beginning of what the Jewish people would call 10 days of awe. It started with this three-day Feast of Tabernacles, but it would end with what is called Yom Kippur, or as the Bible says, the Day of Atonement. This is the day when God would accept the sacrifices of his people and roll back their sins for a year. It was a type of the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world where you didn't have to get your sins rolled back every year. You got them remitted. But the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles was kind of twofold. For one thing, it was to remind the people of God, you've been blessed, the harvest is over. You need to come and thank God for it. And it was also to remind them that Messiah was coming. If you'll notice in Leviticus 23, verse 23, the Bible said, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a blowing, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So God told them, Take a step back. Rest on this day. School teachers, don't go to work. Whatever you do, take the day off. Reflect, remember, Messiah is coming. That was the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles, to remind them that Messiah was coming. The beginning of that day would begin with the blowing of the shofar or the trumpet. You saw it in the text, right? You can blow the trumpet, you can blow YouTube, you can find numerous places where they are showing you what the trumpet sounds like. It sounds like on that day. You want to hear it? Now, the first day, this horn would sound maybe a hundred times. Go with me to Jerusalem for just a moment, all right? And let's hear that trumpet. This is the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. hundred times. Some say a hundred and fifty times that day. They would blow the trumpet. The first day was a call together. The second day was a day of mourning. The trumpet would sound a mournful sound. The third day, the trumpet would sound louder and louder and louder and it was a staccato sound. It was like over and over and over. That was the last trump. 
Jesus was a Jew. If you see a picture of somebody painted of him teaching on the hillside and he didn't have on one of these, it's not an accurate picture. They're not accurate anyway. This was his prayer shawl and he would have wore it when he taught. He would have wore it when he prayed for the sick. The little lady that had an issue of blood who reached out and touched the hem of his garment. You remember that story? This is what she touched right here. She touched the hem of his prayer shawl. That was his garment that he was wearing. She touched it and he was healed. He was a Jew. He practiced these feats. On that day, the Bible said that great day, that last day of the feast, Jesus was there in Jerusalem celebrating with them. What's ironic is that Friday, Friday was the first day of Rosh Hashanah. It's the Feast of Tabernacles began last Friday. It would end the day at sundown. It would end the day. It was kind of interesting to me, and I don't think it has anything to do with prophecy, and it may be incidental. I don't know. God knows. But Supreme Court Justice Ruth Ginsburg passed away on Friday and sent everybody into a tailspin. She was a Jewish lady, and she died on the first day of the Feast of Trumpets. So the purpose of this feast and that horn blowing, the last day would get louder and louder. They did that because when God called Moses to Sinai, there were some things present on Sinai before God spoke. Before he revealed his glory, there was a sound of a trumpet. And if you read the Bible, I don't have time to go to those verses, you can find it. It said that trumpet blew louder and louder and louder. That's God's trumpet. That's God's trumpet. And God works on a calendar, don't forget it. He don't work on our calendar, but he has a calendar. So when that Feast of Tabernacles was going to begin, the priest, an appointed priest, some Levitical priest would go out on the night before it was supposed to start and he would look for the full moon because it was regulated and determined by the night of the full moon in the seventh month, first day. And if it happened to be cloudy and he couldn't see the moon, he would notify the people who would blow the ram's horn, you can't play them tomorrow because they had to know that moon was full. It is believed by many that this is exactly what Jesus was referring to in Luke chapter 24, verse 36, when he said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. The angels in heaven don't know, my Father knows. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage until the day. It was just like any other day. Two people would be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two women at the mill, one taken and the other left. He said, watch therefore. You don't know what hour. They think that possibly Jesus referred to that Feast of Tabernacles. That trumpet was going to sound. If you didn't hear the trumpet sounding, you knew that the priest couldn't see the moon the night before. And so possibly Jesus was saying that, but it's a normal day. It's just you're going about your business. You're doing your thing. They signed this peace treaty, and we all just got up and went to work. It's like a man who gets up and goes to work that particular day on 9-11, kisses his wife bye, tells his family bye. I'll be home tomorrow night. He never came home, right? It's like the man, the wife, that give each other a little goodbye kiss. If you do that sort of thing, if you don't, you ought to start leaving the house in the morning. You don't know what a day holds. Nobody knows what a day holds. You just expect you'll be back that night. And Jesus is saying, that's, that's the way the coming of the Son of Man is going to be. It's just going to be a normal day like any other day. But he said, you got to watch. You got to be ready. You got to wait for that sound, the sound of the trumpet. When that sounded long in Exodus 19 and 19, when, when the Lord was on Sinai, the Bible said it waxed louder and louder and louder. That was a signal that God's fixing to come. The Bible says that Moses spake and God answered him for, with a voice. God spoke out of that mountain and all of his heard him speak. You read that verse with me in Revelation or did I even read it? Maybe I didn't. Where he said every eye is going to see him. A trumpet's going to sound. Paul said the last trump. Very likely he's referring to in symbolism to the last trump that sounded at the feast of, of uh, harvest, at the end of the fall. This is what Jeremiah was saying in 8 and 20 of Jeremiah. He said, the summer is past, the harvest is ended, and we are not saved. 
It was the feast of it was the feast of trumpets. We ought to be ready. We ought to have everything right. We ought to have everything ready. But they didn't know. Now here's my message to you this morning. Behold, he cometh. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my sweet family and the Lord, let's not get so caught up in this world that we let something slip by us this week. A signing of a historic peace treaty that's prophesied about 2,000 years ago by John on the Isle of Patmos and by Daniel 4,000 years ago. It's going to happen. I want to I want to just shout. I want to be a watchman on the wall this morning. I want to tell you, behold, he cometh. Just like any other day, you got up this morning, you came, you got ready, you came to the house of God, you're already talking about where you're going to go eat after the service is over, what you're going to do this evening, it's a normal day. But a watchman climbed up in a tower, he had to remove himself from the, from the hustle and bustle of the street below. A watchman uh, climbed up in the tower and he had to look out, he had to watch, he was looking in, off in the distance and so the feast of trumpets was to tell everybody step back that's what I want you to do right now with me in this service I want you to take a day off I want you to take a moment to rest pull yourself back forget where you're going to eat for a moment forget what you're going to do this afternoon forget the weeds in the flower bed or the bass boat you're taking to the lake forget it just a moment and somebody shout be holy come up and I want to say it out loud I, I want to remind you again, he's going to come, and Paul said, the last trumpet's going to sound. The last trump. He said, three things are going to happen. A trumpet's going to sound. There's going to be a shout. 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 There's going to be a trumpet sound. There's going to be the voice of an archangel, and God's going to shout. And when he shouts, we're getting out of here. We're leaving this world. He's as anxious to come as I am as anxious for him to come. He's skipping over the mountains. He's leaping over the hills. He's looking over the wall. He's saying to the church, rise up. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. ready." Clap your hands to the Lord and shout to him right now with a voice of triumph. Come on, Brother Kendall, help me here. I'm going to wind this thing down. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, we shall be changed. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16, For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout. How many of you want to hear that shout? Gonna wake up the dead. That's a loud shout, isn't it? Huh? They're gonna hear him in Hillcrest. They're gonna hear it at Forest Park. They're gonna hear it at Rose Knee Cemetery on Swan Lake Road. That's a shout. That's God's shout. I bet he can shout louder than you. I bet he could shout this morning and heal Floyd Odom of cancer. I bet the voice of the Lord could calm a sea again for somebody's life. But he's coming back with a shout. And the Bible said every eye is going to see him. The people who pierced him are going to see him with the voice of an archangel. Man, I want to hear that. And with the trump of God, it's God's trump. Somewhere, I know God's a spirit. The only body he ever had was Jesus Christ. But he's got a trumpet. He's got a ram's horn. He's got a shofar. And somewhere down the line, that angel's going to, that angel, the voice of an archangel is going to sound. And, and I, I, I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he has a shofar. It's called the trump of God. And when he blows that trumpet, when he blows that trumpet, look what Paul said is going to happen in this verse. He said, and the dead and Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. There's this There's this. Scripture, we call it the rapture. The rapture is, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Where Paul said we shall be changed when he said the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Somebody say caught up. Caught up. 
to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with him. I'm sorry, I'm fixing to get excited. That word is harpazo in the Greek. It means to snatch away. It means to catch away. That's what Paul was saying. When that voice sounds, when that trumpet sounds, when that archangel sounds, hallelujah. Come on, Kendall, help me preach a little bit. When that voice sounds, he's going to catch the church out. Get up. He said, rise up. I'm skipping over the hills. I'm, I'm leaping over the mountains. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm looking over the wall. I'm looking through the lattice. I'm fixing to catch you out of here. I'm going to get you out. I'm going to snatch you out of this world. Are you ready? <laughs> Woo. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse, verses 2 through 4, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell. Some people believe this is when he was stoned at Lystra and left for dead. Maybe it was, we don't know. But he said, whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up. There's that word, harpazo. It's the same Greek word, snatched out. And I knew such a man, and he says it again, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how he was caught up, harpazo, into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. I will never forget a Hebrew scholar, member of the Dead Sea Scrolls Society, uh, M.D. Treese, preaching on this verse. I will never forget it. He said that Paul was said, I don't know if I'm in the body or I don't know if I'm out of the body. And he said, I wonder if that's what the rapture's gonna feel like. Am I here or am I there? Am I still on the earth? He said he was caught up into paradise. Where is paradise? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but Paul's like, am I here or am I there? All I know is he left there and he came back here and finished the work God called him to do. But that's the way the rapture's gonna be. I got to imagining this week. Oh my God, I got to thinking about it. We talk about streets of gold and gates of pearl. We talk about all that stuff. I, I don't, that, that's not even what I'm interested in. I live in a pretty nice place right now. If you make 34,000 a year, you're better, you're in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. We're doing pretty good right now. I don't even have to have a street of gold. I'm pretty satisfied with the concrete. Let's get the potholes out of it, please, Louisiana. Amen. Amen. But I tried to imagine what it's going to be like. I don't know what he's going to look like. John saw him in Revelation. He didn't look like any of those pictures you've seen of him where he looks like he's kind of a sissy, you know. Got that little rude Jonas cheek and that forget all that business. They, they drew those pictures 1,500 years after he was on the earth. He walked the roads of Galilee. You got to know he was dark complected and he had a tan on top of that dark skin. Yeah, you got to know he had that prayer shawl around his shoulders. But when John saw him, that's not what he saw. He said he had eyes like fire. He had hair like wool. A two-edged sword came out of his mouth. His feet, his feet look like brass that's been burned in the fire. That's the Jesus we're going to see. And he said every eye is going to see him. And I'm going to pinch myself when that rapture takes place. I'm going to have to pinch myself. Am I here or am I there? How fast is it going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye? It's like every other day. It's just like any other day. But one moment, I'm here, and the next moment, I'm here. But what's it going to be like when I see the man who died for me? Can you shout hallelujah? Oh, somebody ought to clap your hands. Somebody ought to clap your hands. Get ready. The bridegroom's coming. He's leaping, he's skipping. He's looking over the wall. He's coming after his church. Stand with me, please, as I hasten to end this. Years ago, Gene and I were evangelizing. We were young, newlyweds, having fun. For five years, I traveled. In those days, you normally stayed in the pastor's home with the pastor in one of his bedrooms. If they put you in a hotel, 
it probably was not a hotel you would want to stay in. We used to travel, and before cell phones and all that, you had to call back, let your family know, let your, where you know, the phone number of the hotel you were staying in, and the room number. And it was a joke, if it's, if it's single digits, they know you're in a bad hotel. It's like if you're in room seven, that ain't good. So we were staying with one of the godliest, closest to God men I ever met in my life. We stayed in that home for two weeks, and that man rocked my world. His name's Marvin Cole. They called him Bubba Cole. He's a pastor. He's still alive. He's probably 90 years old. At his house, you didn't have an option if you're the evangelist. He just came and got you and said, come on, Brother Jerry, let's go pray. And we may go to the church. We may go to one of the rooms in his house. And I couldn't pray because I was listening to him pray. And he talked to God like I'm talking to you right now. I distinctly remember. I don't remember the lady's name. I'll make one up. But I was listening to him pray. And he said, now, God, he said, yesterday, Sally called me, Sister Sally. And she was sick. And I, I took my oil and I went by and prayed for her like you told me to do. And she called me this morning and told me she's still sick. Now, God, what do you want me to tell her? I don't know what to tell her. And I'm over there like, oh, God, Jesus. Praise God. Glad to be here. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Behold. Come on. So one day, he said, come here, Brother Jerry. Let's go to the living room. And he had a stack of preaching notes. This high. Just paper. Will you write your notes out on paper. I'm old enough to remember that, okay? And, and he said, I want to share some of my sermons I preached. I said, wait a minute, let me get my notepad. Because when you're a preacher, you beg, borrow, steal, you do anything you can do to get a sermon. I'm, you know, the Bible said a man steals because he's hungry. He, he's not going to be despised. I always felt like the church was hungry, so I, sometimes I have to steal, all right? I'm, <laughs> nothing new under the sun anyway. And he was going through those sermons. He, he showed me one called Victims of Supposition, Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And the Bible said they supposed he was in their company and they went three days. And I preached it everywhere, man. I was an evangelist. Somebody said they don't believe in preaching a sermon twice. What? What are you going to do if you need Acts 238 twice, huh? And he pulled one out. And I was writing somewhere in some box, somewhere. I have the words. I have some of the things. It was called the greatest sign of the coming of the Lord. And he read me Psalm 102 and 16. Get your Bible, Brother Jerry. Let's read Psalm 102 and 16. And it said, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in glory. You see, Zion is his church. God's going to get us ready. I feel the power of the Lord in this place all day today. This is kind of like old time church we used to have before they shut us down. I ain't shutting down no more. You going to stay with me? Maybe I should not say never. I don't have plans of doing that anymore. The Lord's building up Zion right now. You see, America, we think God's either a Democrat or Republican. He's neither. All right? We think of God as conservative or liberal. He's neither. He's God. We got his book here, you know? We got his book here. He's not an American. He's not waving the United States flag. I'm sorry to hurt your feelings. If he's waving one, it's a star of David. Yeah. Yeah, but there's revival happening all over the world right now. People are being baptized all over the world. People are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost all over the world. You see, I grew up when nobody spoke in tongues. Nobody. The little church that I went to with 35 people, they thought we were crazy. They thought we had lost our minds. That, you know, we, we were on the other side of the track. Do you know what God's doing? 800 million people today on planet Earth are tongue talkers. They're speaking in tongues. All the time somebody said, oh, that don't happen anymore. I beg your pardon. It's still happening. Hallelujah. He said, in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh. In, 
in, in communist China where they can't even meet like we're meeting today. They're meeting underground. They're meeting in houses and thousands of people are being baptized every day in the name of Jesus and receiving the Holy Ghost in bathtubs and in houses and in the woods. God is building up Zion. My mother's 94 years old. She's probably watching us. If she didn't watch us in the first service, she's watching us in her little room right now. Mama, I wouldn't be looking for the graveyard. I'd be looking for the rapture. He's coming. Behold, he cometh. So in my day, I told you I was going to be a few minutes and I wasn't lying. I just can't help myself. When my dad died, my brother Dan, the singer at Center Trio, Phillips, Craig, and Dean, he, uh, he told in the sermon about a phone call. He had a message, and he's probably still got it. He'd never get rid of it. It was when my dad called him. My dad couldn't do much, but he wanted you to call him every day, and if you didn't call him all the time, he'd get on you. He used to tell me, Jerry, Mark calls me every day. That's my baby brother. Baby's the right word for him, too. So Dan told about Daddy called him. He had it on his phone. He said, I'll never get rid of this. And the message wasn't too long, but it was a reprimand. Call me, Dan. Call your dad. Why didn't you call your dad? So Dan said, I've still got that recording, and I'll always have it. So Randy Phillips, who's a member of his trio, was in the crowd that day at the funeral, and he heard that and he went home and penned the words to a song that we're going to play before we leave today. Words will be on the screen with it. And you can listen to it. It's called Voices from the Other Side. I don't hear them yet, but I think they're coming.
coming. And there really is a coming. Savior. And he's really on the throne. And there's no more separation. No more sorrow. No more pain. And there ain't a single tear inside. And someday we'll be together just rejoicing. Yeah, these days that's what I hear when I hear voices from the other side. Are you ready for that trumpet to sound? Give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Hear those voices from the other side saying, keep up the fight. Behold, he cometh. Come on, before you leave, shout. Clap your hands. Get ready, get ready, get ready. The watchman's got to remove himself from the street below. Let's back up today and remember, Messiah is coming again. Come on, one more time. Clap your hands. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Sister Wendy, you made our day. Thank you for that beautiful song. And your testimony lifted our spirits. God bless you all in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll see you Wednesday night, if the Lord be willing, and if he hadn't come before then.